Okay, so we're going to go ahead and get started. My name is Erica Martin. I was a part of the Critical Issues Symposium Committee that helped plan all of this. And it is my honor to introduce Dr. Dibble. Uh, Dr. Jason Dibble is a professor within and is currently the chair of the Department of Communications here at Hope College. He holds a Bachelor of Science degree in Biomedical Science and a Master's in Communication. Both are from Western Michigan University. His PhD in Communications is from Michigan State University. Here at Hope, Dr. Dibble regularly teaches courses on interpersonal communication and communication within relationships. He researches various topics such as breaking bad news, how social media impacts personal relationships, and the relationships people form with media characters. He's had his research and writing mentioned in national outlets such as NBC News, The Wall Street Journal, The Atlantic, Time, Fox News, CNN, and Yahoo News. Please help me welcome Dr. Dibble to the stage. Thank you, Erica. Are we on? Am I on? Is this on? Ben, can you hear me? All right. Raise your hand if you've either seen me speak before or else this is your first time right now. That's what I thought. Okay. Uh, so... Good. Just wanted to make sure that this whole thing was working. Hey, big round of applause for Erica and all of the CIS team. You know the students planned it this year, right? Give them a round of applause. We are really, 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 really proud. So thank you, thank you, thank you. CIS is a big thing we do every year, um, and it's good to be back. I know we kind of had a, a little bit of a hiccup with the COVID years, but it's good to see you all. And thank you for coming in. I know the professors say class is canceled, and you all could have just taken off, but you are dedicated to learning. So thank you for squeezing the most out of your $40,000 a year that you spend to be here because this is part of it, people. All right, um, so as Erica said, I'm a communication professor. That's what I study, and I do dabble in the media a little bit, in particular social media, and I'm interested in how social media impacts our interpersonal relationships and the way that we communicate like what we're doing right now. So I'm going to start by getting very vulnerable with you. I call this talk turning into trolls and name callers. And I'm going to put up my phone to make sure that I don't run over. I'm told we only have an hour and a half together, so I don't want to blow that. So what, uh, I'm going to start with um, something that really happened to me. Toward the end of 2020, you maybe remember that was the year of no toilet paper, um, I was called by a reporter from CNN and they wanted me to comment on a story they were writing about how you can keep your sanity and how you can keep connected to your friends and, and family, even if you're trying to maintain a COVID bubble. So I don't know if you tried to do a COVID bubble thing or maybe you've heard about it. That was it. I'm an interpersonal communication researcher. That was my goal, was just to help people with their communication. And so um, this was the story that came out. And it didn't take very long, as if you've ever spent time on social media, for uh, the trolls and the flamers to come out. And uh, I think maybe they were more interested in just that particular news outlet, and they maybe had an axe to grind against them. I don't think they knew the reporter. I'm, I know they don't know me. But anyway, it didn't take very long before um, the Twitter, the, whoever did this post, found the Twitter handles of myself and the other people who were... Uh, quoted in the article, and this was their response. So here's me. This is an amazing example of the extremely dangerous authoritarian conceit found among some academics that's responsible for, I like this part, the thorough 2020 societal destruction. I've never been given that much credit for anything before, but I am now responsible for taking down all of society in 2020. You're welcome. Um, so in this case, it says, by the helpful tyrant. So I say, here it is, Jason Dibble, helpful tyrant. I'm going to write it on my name tag going forward. Um, when people ask, what's my personal brand? Oh, I'm helpful tyrant. So that's apparently what I'm going for now. And so you see this kind of stuff going on. Um, let me show you. Here's some, some screenshots that actually that the story reported. So just so you can see what I said to, to play fair, right? You've heard one side, I'm a helpful tyrant. Draw your own conclusions. Here's a little screenshot. Here's part of the story that I was quoted in. Um, try to convey your message in a spirit of caring. That's so tyrannical, right? Uh, underscore that it's not an easy decision to make, even if it's your right decision. If we're going to observe the concept of bubbles, well, then there might be insiders and outsiders. Instead of focusing on who's inside or outside, 
suggests maintaining social contact through whatever means are safely available. Am I cramping on, I mean, is this societal destruction here in your mind? I don't know. Apparently, I'm the helpful tyrant here, right? I'm bringing it all down. Um, here's another one, just, to, you know, another part of the article that I was mentioned in. Um, disagreements, blah, 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 blah. Acknowledge their point of view and ask them for their understanding. If for no other reason, then they care about you. Acknowledge point of view, care. I don't know. Does this sound like authoritarian conceit? Does this sound like tyrannical, whatever I was, the helpful tyrant? Um, anyway, well, obviously when this sort of stuff happens, you don't engage it because all that does is just re-up it in the, uh, the algorithms and it just keeps get, getting perpetuated. And over time, this kind of has, has faded. It'll, it'll come up once in a while when somebody latches onto it and likes that particular post. I'll get a little ping on my phone that says, hey, you know. But for the most part, this has kind of gone away. Um, and this is a much more, a, a milder case of this situation than some people. You know, entire reputations are sometimes ruined in terms of uh, on social media. So, but it is a close-to-home example of the sort of bullying and the trolling and the abuse that do kind of throw, flow through um, the socials. And you probably have experienced or seen um, some of your own examples. So that's what I want to talk about today, namely how have our media technologies and social media in particular um, impacted our interpersonal communication with each other. And here's how I want to carve up our time today. So um, first of all, I want to set the table by zooming out a little bit and talk a little bit about how we got to this point. What are the things you're bringing to the encounter in terms of your psychology? What are some social dynamics that we might want to be aware of? Um, and of course, all of this is happening in a cauldron of rapidly changing media ecology. So new technologies are coming um, all the time. Um, I can't even keep track of the apps that you're on right now. I mean, are we even still doing Insta? Is Insta a thing? Is Snapchat still a thing? I know we're into TikTok, right? Or is TikTok gone now? Are we doing TikTok still? Right? See, I'm, it's hard to keep up with all of that, right? Um, and they're, it's constantly changing. Um, and so we've got all this going on. Um, then I want to talk about some structural features about social media. Maybe that's what you're really here to, to hear more about, so I want to hit you there. And then finally we'll wrap up with some practical takeaways. I always want to give you something that you can take away and use right away. Sound good? All right. Well, let's start with how did we get here. Um, let's talk about some things like, for example, some psychological dynamics. And I'll kind of go through these a little bit quicker because maybe you've already heard of some of them. One of this, the biggies is confirmation bias. How many of you have heard confirmation bias before? Right? It's this sense that you basically start with a, pre a belief, something you already believe, and then you're looking for evidence that's consistent with that belief. And you're kind of putting on blinders and you're rejecting any ideas that might not be consistent with that belief. So if you've taken a social science class, you learn that is the difference between confirmation and falsification. Well, this is confirmation and not falsification. You're not trying. So if I start with an idea, for example, that all swans in the world are white, confirmation would be I'm aggressively looking for more white swans. That's all I'm paying attention to. But what we really should be trying to do is falsify our ideas. That's kind of the, the remedy or the, the antidote to confirmation bias is attempt to falsify your ideas. Start with those ideas that you really wish were true and look for evidence that they're not true. This is the, the sort of the journalist mantra. It's those stories that you really, really want to believe are the ones that you should work the hardest to vet. Those are the ones you should work the hardest to try and falsify. So if you're somebody, you know, just taking stuff from the headlines, a lot of people believe that ivermectin is a great treatment for COVID. And um, they just look for stories that confirm what they want to believe about it. And they ignore the pile of research, the pile of stories that says it's not an effective treatment. This is an example of confirmation bias. can get us in trouble. Um, we also have another preference for the familiar. We, have, we want to pay more attention to things that are familiar to us. And so, for example, one of the things we know is that we trust stories, if they're shared with us on social media, from a friend. 
you're actually paying closer attention to the person who sent it to you than you are the actual headline of the story. And if it's a person that you like, if it's a person that you trust, then you're more likely to believe the story. Weirdly enough, nowadays we actually trust Google search results more than we do professional legacy news outlets. And these people, I mean, these news outlets are actually, they do kind of get themselves into hot water from time to time, but for the most part, they're trying to shoot down the middle. They're trying to give you some straight facts reporting, but we listen to people who say we can't trust the media, and what do we turn to? Google search results, uh, because these are the things that are familiar to us. So um, that's, we've really kind of moved the goalposts, in other words, in terms of how we decide what information's credible and what's not. And then there's also this thing called the illusion of knowledge. And this is the tendency for us to think we know more than we actually do about an issue. We all think we're experts, right? And all we hear is, go do your research. Go do your own research. Well, I was doing a lot of research. Well, I am a trained professional researcher, and nobody's talking about the kind of research that I actually do. Right? They're talking about just spending more time online, getting down into the wormhole, doing your research. Well, over time, you start to build up this sense that you know more about the issue than you actually do. And these things kind of pile up on each other. you got confirmation bias, preference for the familiar, illusion of knowledge. Case in point, check this out. I found a quote about the illusion of knowledge, and we can't even figure out who gave us the quote. Two separate people are attributed with saying the exact same thing. So here's a quote about the illusion of knowledge. The greatest enemy of knowledge is not ignorance, it's the illusion of knowledge. But we can't even point out to whether it was Stephen Hawking or Borson who said it, right? Because we all think we're just right, so we quick rip it off, put it on a meme, bam, we're good to go. So I can't think of a better case in point for illusion of knowledge than, than this. Um, anyway... Then there's just more to realize about how the brain operates. Now, I know some of you are doing the neuroscience thing, and I think that's great that you can study that here at Hope. You really can get into the nitty-gritty of the brain. But one of the things that I don't see talked about very much in our zeitgeist is how the brain's natural default is actually to believe. Your brain is hardwired to be more efficient is to be as efficient as it can. And one of the ways you are designed is to just go ahead and believe until something tells you not to. Which is really weird. It kind of flies in the face of some of our original thinking, right? So you remember Rene Descartes, the guy that I think therefore I am? He was that guy. He used to believe, and a lot of us still do, that you can hold a thought in your head in some sort of neutral way. You can represent it in your head and think about it, and then later in a separate step, you can evaluate it for whether it's true or not. And it seems so intuitive that most of us don't even question that that might not be the case. Um, but that's actually not how the brain works. When you actually look at the research, what you find is that your brain actually doesn't hold ideas in a neutral way. When you are working to understand what I'm saying right now, your brain, in, in the back of, at least behind the scenes, is giving me credit for being true. Your brain's default is to believe. And it's only later in a second step where you might gather some more information where we would say you certify that belief, which would mean you keep believing it, or you unaccept the belief that you previously, certif or that you previously held on to. So you're not left to be a gullible dupe. Right? I'm not trying to say that. But can you think of situations that might stop you from thinking more deeply about an issue? When you're tired, when you're worn out, when you're bombarded by our less than 24 news hour news cycle now where it's just spitting out story after story after story, or you're stuck on a website just looking at more and more stuff, or people on social media are just spamming you with all this kind of stuff, you don't have time to sit back and actually sift through what's credible and what's not. And what you don't realize is that your brain is hanging on to the ideas that got there first, and it's believing them. And this is something you just don't hear talked about and by the pundits and the people who go on TV and all the people who write in the op-eds. You know, they sit there and point the finger at social media or whatever, but a lot of this has to do with just how our brain believes and constructs belief. 
So that's the actual default is to believe. Um, well, why does this matter? Because if we tax your brain and we wear you out to the point where you can't really think and scrutinize information, then you will be left holding on to the original belief. So there are those, there are you know, people who are bad actors in our world who are just flooding our social medias with what I kind of nickname raw sewage. It's just absolutely, dis it's not just misinformation. Misinformation means I made a mistake and I said something that's false, but I didn't mean to. It's disinformation, which is I know this is false and I don't care because I'm just trying to muck everything up. And so you have people that are doing this and they're just flooding the airwaves with bad information whether they know it or not, the way this works so well is because your brain's default is to believe what you understand. And then if I stop you from thinking more critically about that issue, you're left believing it. That's a common cult persuasion tactic for crying out loud. Um, and we know that uh, experimentation has been very uh, consistent with this idea. Spinoza, it's Benedict Spinoza who came up with it. He was the rival of Rene Descartes. So if you've ever heard about Spinoza, my Com360 students hear this story. And it's probably the only class where you get to hear about it unless you take a philosophy class here at Hope. Um, one of the things we know is that military units, if when you run, we run, we've run experiments with military units where the control group gets regular sleep and the experimental group gets deprived of sleep for 24 to 36 hours. And one thing we know is that if you're deprived of sleep for 24 to 36 hours, those military units are less likely to question an order that's illegal or unethical from a, a commanding officer. So they're more likely if the order comes to go bomb that church over there. Okay. That was my officer who said so. I'm just following orders. Or go bomb that elementary school over there. Or go whatever the, you know, the, illegal is, the illegal issue is. This is why the Spinozan model of belief is so important to consider because it has huge implications for um, how we get along with each other. And you see this also playing out, of course, with social media. So um, the, the idea then here is belief is the default. It's doubting that takes more work. Um, and that's sometimes work that we're not willing to do, um, and it could get us in trouble. And of course, there are environmental changes that are happening too. Um, one of the things that we're seeing is an erosion of context. So technologies are making it easier, in, uh, making it easier to connect with others, but as our technology accelerates, it also comes with a decrease in your attention span. Um, we just don't have the ability to pay attention like we used to in, in the old days. Um, let me illustrate for you. So again, my apologies to my, my Con360 persuasion students. They've seen this before. Here are some colonial ads. I love these. Take a look at how in colonial times they used to sell coffee. Here's an ad for coffee. Very good ground coffee for eight shillings a pound. That sounds like a good price, right? 14 ounces to the pound which is the extent of what it makes when properly roasted, remember F's were S's back then, uh, to be sold by Israel Eaton living near the Mill Bridge, where persons may have chocolate and also coffee ground for 18 pence a pound. Contrast that to how we sell coffee now. Right? What's different? The words, right? No words, hardly any words. It's all pictures. Now, I understand they didn't have the graphic arts capabilities that we have today, but we also don't have the attention span to process this. Check it out. Here's grocery store ad. Contrast that with how we sell groceries now. Rock that thanks dinner, Thanksgiving dinner. Right there's Meyer. Here's a beer ad. Colonial beer. Right by Robert Watley at the sign of the lighthouse at the North End, Boston. Old strong beer, not inferior to English beer. By the barrel, blah, 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 blah. How do we sell alcohol now? Like this, right? It's all image-based. There's nothing to process in terms of words, nothing that you have to spend a lot of time thinking about because we've just lost that ability to do that. Um, Political debates actually featured two candidates 
that would sit there and engage each other. You've heard of the Lincoln-Douglas debates, right? I had to do some research on this myself. It wasn't just one debate. It was a series of seven. And each one, do you know how each one lasted? How long each one lasted? Three hours, that's right. Each one lasted three hours. They were given an uninterrupted amount of time to talk. Then the other candidate would talk. And then they had another bit of a time where they could sort of go back and forth and rebut each other. But now we don't see anything like that. You look at a political debate today and there's absolutely no debating going on. One, it's just answering a question, if they even answer that anymore. And it's become more of a show. Um, in one debate, you'll have 16 candidates on the stage and it'll last two hours. Right? Whereas the Lincoln-Douglas debates, it was two people over seven times, three hours a time. 21 hours worth of debate. Right? you got to stream that on Netflix. But we don't do that now. In fact, we put down people who put out too many words. We have an expression now. Right? TLDR. That's our response for somebody. That's our excuse. We, we don't say, oh, you know, you're right. My intention span is actually kind of down. No, we put it back on you and say, too long, didn't read. Right? You didn't accommodate my feeble attention span. And so I'm now calling you the wrong guy. All right. Um, let's get, let me skip ahead a quick because I don't want to um, lose too much time here. Um, one of the things I want to talk about then is our, our, uh, how social media is um, structured when it comes to um, how it impacts our communication. And one of the things that we see with social media, especially when you use your phones, is that everything looks the same on your phone. It's all formatted to look the same, right? When you're looking at a little tiny screen, your brain doesn't register much difference between a legitimate news website or a YouTube video or a TikTok video or a meme. It all just kind of looks the same. And your brain then just kind of starts to think it's all equally important or maybe it's just not very important. Um, and you don't really pay attention to the things that you should be paying attention to. Um, our social media is also designed to give you more of whatever you click on. You've got to remember, these are companies who are out to make a profit. What are they selling? What's the primary commodity that social media companies sell? Do you know? They sell you, exactly. And they sell you to who? The advertisers. They make their money off of advertising by selling an audience to the advertisers. We are the commodity. You are the commodity. Your eyeballs are the commodity. So they're looking for ways not to just help you be social, but to keep you on your phone, to keep you looking at your socials, to keep you engaged so they can sell you to more advertisers. So they play with the algorithms, right? They give you more of the things that you like, that you share. They pay attention to who you're affiliated with, who you follow, and they try to line you up with more people like that. And so it just gives you more and more of what you click on. And over time, of course, then your feed gets narrower and narrower. You start to lose other perspectives because it just keeps shrinking it down to try and dial in exactly what it thinks you're going to want. And it thinks it's just giving you more of that. And then think back to what we talked about with confirmation bias and illusion of knowledge and all of these things just become one big giant swirl. And it just all keeps going for it. And that's where you get the echo chambers that people often talk about. Um, the other thing you got to know about is the algorithms. Right? The algorithms, they have our number. And they're programmed to activate your emotional responses. They're mainly two, which is Joy and outrage. If they can't get you happy, they want to make you flaming mad. In either way, that gets you involved because we just can't resist something. When we're mad, I got to say something. I got to type out a message. I got to put the angry emoji out there. Somehow I have to engage the system when I'm mad. So what ends up happening is the social media companies, they don't really care as long as you stay on your phone. But what ends up happening is Cute puppies and hilarious TikTok videos get shared and get promoted, but so does hate speech. So pro-social things get promoted, but also anti-social things get promoted because it makes people angry. 
And in social media, it's the most extreme views, good or bad, that get promoted the fastest and the farthest. And of course, then you already know about the bots too, right? Right, the bots are fake accounts. You can actually go to bot farms where people, you can pay them money to have bots created to create followers for your Insta feed or for your Twitter feed or whatever it is, and people do, so that they can look popular because it's the popular accounts that the rest of us are attracted to but a lot of those followers aren't actual human beings. They're bots. They're, we call them bots because they're just fake accounts. But the bots then end up masquerading as real people, and you think that they're liking a story when it's really just a bunch of bots. So you have to watch out. Um, another theorist that I really like is Sherry Turkle. Anybody heard of Sherry Turkle? So Sherry, Thur- Sherry Turkle is a sociologist from MIT, which is pretty known for smart people, right? You can't get into Hope College, you go to MIT. Makes pretty good sense, right? Smart, smart people go there. Um, she wrote a book called Reclaiming Conversation, and um, one of her main, the main thesis in this book is that she's been um, arguing that over time, the more time we've been spending on our screens, the less empathic we've been to each other. So there's sort of an inverse relationship between the more time you spend on your screen, the less empathy we've been showing. And she's arguing that there's, she thinks there's actually a causal relationship here where it's our time spent on screens is eroding or eating away at our empathy for other people. And some of that makes some sense because, I mean, really, when you think about when you're texting people or you're interacting over social media, if we're not in the room together, I don't actually have to witness how my words impact you. I don't have to see that you put a little, you know, kind of a, a, maybe a smirk on your face when I said something that indicated you really liked it, you liked it. Or maybe you put a little half frown on your face that kind of indicated that, you know, that you weren't really cool with what I said. When we're, when we're separated, you don't see any of those nonverbal cues that we call, we call those nonverbal cues, and you don't actually see how our words impact other people. So you get a little more bold next time, and you kind of dispense with a little more politeness. You did and you do it again, and you do it again. Pretty soon, compared to where you were starting, if you were in a face-to-face conversation, now you're just downright rude to each other. And so yesterday's rudeness becomes a platform for tomorrow's rudeness, and it just keeps going down. And that's what Turkle argues is eroding our empathy for other people. And we do see, when you look at research, you look at most metrics um, on various populations, whether it's college students or medical students or society in general, we have, over the last several years, become less empathic toward one another. We've cared more about ourselves and less about each other, Um, which, I don't know, maybe that's not such a great thing. But anyway, case in point, right, we try to reclaim things um, in terms of when we're, we're not in, using, um, when we're using our screens and we're not in the same room together talking to each other, we try to put back some of that missing nonverbal information. What's, what's the rule these days with periods? If someone puts a period at the end of your, uh, their text message to you, what, what, what meaning do you give that? They're being, They're being I would hope so, right? But most of us don't go there, right? We get a little anxiety. Wait, you don't write, you're, you're not supposed to, how are you supposed to end a text message to like your, your friends? You're supposed to have, I would say bring back the period, but what do you, what do you say? You, you're supposed to put exclamation point. Just one? No, a bunch. Right? If I don't see a bunch of exclamation points, then what, you mad, bro? No, I'm just being grammatically correct which is all I was saying, this was a statement. It only calls for a period. Ask any English major. Right? We probably have some in the room here who can confirm this. But no, we've gotten anxious about the period now because that doesn't convey the right tone, which tells me as a communication researcher that we are still worried about how we come across. We are still worried about things like nonverbal communication, and we work to try and put it back into our text messages. But me, sitting over here as the interpersonal guy going, just go meet with each other. Put down your dang phone and make a coffee date. Go hang out. Spend time in each other's space. Breathe the same air. Safely, of course, with the COVID thing. I get it. Right? Try to use the same space. 
The time that you spend separated on the screens, that is what's eating away at our ability to empathize with each other. And I'm, there's, I'm, I'm concerned and I also find hope in it. I, this, as much as I laugh at it, it does give me hope because it tells me you're still eking out. You're still trying to claw out a way to put back in some of that missing nonverbal information. And it tells me you care about it. And that's what I like. But I would say, just take the next step. Use the text message to set up a live date. And then go hang out and spend time with each other. See how your words impact each other, how they feel on your face, how they feel on your body. When we start to do that, then we can get back to reclaiming that empathy that Turkle says we're, we're starting to miss. I like this guy here. <laughs> this, is, this is you, grammatical guy. I'm fine with, okay, what's with the periods, right? We're concerned. That you're supposed to use exclamation points, right? This is just evidence that people are worried about the periods now. I gave up exclamation points for Lent, right? So it's, it's you guys, right? What the heck? Why? Right? We, we got anxious about the period. We, I don't know why. It's got to be exclamation points, otherwise we're worried. Right? So maybe we can get back to the period if we can get back to empathizing with each other and spend less time in screen world because it helps us care about each other more. Okay, um, I want to give you some tips then for constructive disagreement with what time we have left. So here's some practical takeaways for you. Um, the first one is you got to remember that the social media platforms are not really playing fair. They're selling you to advertisers. That's why they exist. Now, I understand you might hear people like Mark Zuckerberg or whatever, and they talk about Meta's big goals for the world and blah, 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 blah. But at the end of the day, it's still a business. Its goal is to turn a profit. And the way they turn a profit is by selling advertising. And really what they're selling is you to the advertisers who pay to get their ads in front of you. So keep that in perspective. We call it social media, but it's really selling you media to advertisers. So if you want to, you know, that can help start to break some of the, the spell that it has over us. Um, and they do it by pumping up the stories that make us more outraged or extremely happy. Um, and so what you find out then is the stories that get curated on your feeds might not reflect what America is thinking, or what the world is thinking on an issue. And instead, it's the algorithms just feeding you more of what you've been interacting with. So what I would say is then the next thing is focus on interpersonal connections. Give credit for people. Find something to give the other person credit for, especially if you're in a disagreement with somebody. Focus on connecting. Focus on the big picture. The goal for our time together is for me to connect with you. It's not to agree with you, and it's not to make you agree with me. I'm not here to change your mind. I'm here to find points of connection. And if I can get that far, that's fine. So what I always try to say is, Find, or what I say is try to find something that you can give the other person credit for. And let me give you an example. I was raised in a pretty conservative household by a pretty conservative father who loved me dearly but has some pretty conservative views. Now, this is a good time for me to remind you, I, am, I need my conservative friends and I need my liberal thinking friends. I need all my thinking friends. I'm just glad if you're a thinking friend, to be honest with you. And I need people to be concerned about the things that conservatives tend to be concerned about. And I need people to be concerned about things that liberal-minded people tend to be concerned about. That's the only way I'm going to be a better person and move forward in the world. So it just so happens that I was raised in a pretty conservative household by a, a dad who thinks, who's concerned about a lot of things that conservatives are concerned about. And I wasn't even trying to pick any kind of fight, but, you know, he was over at my house one day, and he started bringing up the issue of um, the, you probably remember the tragedy at Oxford High School, really horrible shooting, um, terrible, terrible situation. 
he brought it up because it was in the news at the time, and he, you know, kind of wanted to put his little spin and stamp on it. And I didn't want to get into a debate about Second Amendment rights and all that kind of thing. That wasn't my goal. Um, clearly, he had thoughts on his mind that he wanted me to hear, so I listened to him. And my response wasn't to try and change his mind or shut him down. It was to say, Dad, I love you, and I know. So I gave him credit for how he raised me. I gave him credit. I said, Dad, I know is if I were to pull something like that and try to bring a gun like that to school, you would know long before the school knew. And he went, damn right. Which was, I mean, that, I was giving him credit for how he raised me to do the right thing which is, and he, you know, it was also an admission that that was a horrible thing that that young person did when they brought the, school, the gun to school. But I didn't go into a big debate about gun rights and gun safety and all that kind of stuff. I gave him credit for what he did well with me. Dad, you raised me to know the difference between right and wrong, and I'm grateful for that. And, and we could keep talking. We didn't shut each other down. Um... It, more dad stories. He, uh, when he discovered email a bunch of years ago, he uh, would just pass along any meme. We didn't call them memes yet. It was just these junk spam chain emails that he would send. He would send me one, and sometimes it would be hooked up to some sort of you know, video that was just clearly propaganda. It was, incre it was crazily hyper-partisan propaganda. And instead of me coming back and just saying, Dad, what kind of dumb, you know, idiotic, whatever, 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 I just said, Dad, I know you raised me to know that this is just shameless propaganda. And I'm really grateful that you raised somebody smart enough to know the difference between good information and shameless propaganda. And he was kind of caught in his tracks. I mean, what's he going to do? Come back and say, no, I didn't raise a smart kid. Right? No! I gave, him a, I gave him an out. Right? I gave him credit for something that he did that I love and I appreciate him for. Do we have to see eye to eye on every issue? No. Did I try to make him see things exactly as I do? No. I just found a way to connect. And we could keep talking. And we could have the next conversation. And the goal isn't to, maybe they never come over to your side, but you also don't have to go to their side. That's not the goal. The goal is to keep talking, keep finding ways to relate. And here's a follow-up. When you're talking to somebody, give them a place to land. People need a way to save face. When you back people into a corner, cognitive dissonance theory already tells us they're never going to let down. Right? Think of somebody who's got a really extreme, ish, uh, extreme view on an issue in your life right now. You all can find somebody. And you keep wondering, what's the evidence going to take? What, what evidence is it going to take before they change their mind and come away from that position? And the answer is probably nothing. Why? Because they've tied their identity to this issue. And when they've made it who they are, and I don't know how this has happened, but suddenly being on Team Red or Team Blue has become our, our only jersey that we wear these days, then if it's tied into your identity, you're never going to back away from it because to do that would be to deny yourself, and no one's going to do that. So you got to keep that in mind when you're talking to people. Give them an out. Give them a place to land. Give them somewhere. I'm not saying give them... I'm not saying agree with them. I'm saying give them a place to land. Where did I give my dad a place to land? We could agree on the fact that he raised a smart kid and that he's a good parent who cares and that he does matter, you know, that his kids know the difference between right and wrong. I gave him a place to go. I gave him a place to land. He could sit there and go, cool. You got to give people a place to land. Don't ridicule them. Don't keep backing them into a corner because they're never going to change their mind. That's the sure way to guarantee that they don't come around. And we already know from seeing several case studies and examples where people have had really, really extreme beliefs and their beliefs are disconfirmed and they just double down and hang on to them even more tightly, even in the face of overwhelming evidence to the contrary, because they've internalized it. It's become who they are. The issue is who they are now. And when somebody's made it their identity, it's really hard to get them out. 
So you got to give people a place to land. Um, so no traps, no gotcha moments. That's not what it's for. Um, and you got to resist the urge to ridicule. And then here's one I love. This kind of follows, this kind of all go together. So when you're giving somebody a place to land uh, and you're being aware that people tie their identity to their, their beliefs often, you have to, if you're going to have a discussion, frame it in terms of consequences and not in terms of their values, right? We can debate values if you really want to and you just want to burn some energy, but it's always going to be a dead end. Because if somebody has it tied into their values, you're not going to get them to come off of that. Instead, if you want to have a healthy, constructive conversation, focus on the consequences. Ask the question, well, if it played out that way, what really could happen? What good things could happen? What bad things could happen? And don't just hold on to your own side and say, well, my side's all good and their side's all bad. Ask the same question, both sides of the coin for both sides. Right? Well, if it plays out the way you're calling for, what's good and what's bad? Or what about the other side? If it plays out this way, what's good and what's bad about it? But frame it in terms of consequences. So, for example, you know, if you think about mask mandates. A lot of people got really, you know, flapped up about it. But they jumped right to their values, they frame the issue instead of, well, what really could happen to us if we all wore masks or didn't all wear masks? What really could happen? Instead, it just became issues about, you know, um, the government can't tell me what to do. Well, that's a value. Or things like, well, I guess you're just okay and have no regard for human life. That's another value. And those were the arrows we were zinging at each other. Well, no wonder nobody relented and we just got angrier and angrier at each other. We were fighting about values. And nobody was asking the question about, well, what really could happen if we didn't wear masks? Well, what really could happen if we started to wear masks? So frame the issue in terms of consequences. Um, abortion issues today are rarely framed by our leaders in terms of what could happen realistically if they were completely banned or if they were completely unregulated. Instead, it just becomes about values like government overreach, control over one's body, states' rights, and so on. I'm not trying to say how you should believe about the issue. You understand that, right? They're just using this issue as this is... People are tie, they're tying values to it, though, and where a conversation that actually could help us is in terms of consequences. Well, what would be some real-life practical consequences if we did it this way? What would be some, re and then you got to entertain the other side, what would be some real-life practical consequences if we did it this way? If you start to talk about consequences instead of values, it becomes easier. Um, and so, one, that does, just does two things. First of all, it leads us to see that we don't really understand an idea as well as we thought we did um, because we didn't really work through the consequences, so that punches through that illusion of knowledge. And it also opens us up to new ways of thinking, which helps to get us around what? Confirmation bias. So debating consequences is great. Debating values is a dead end. And then the last one that I have is don't demand instant answers from people. Give each other time to think. One of my greatest tips I learned recently was when someone sends me an email, I will respond right away, but it'll be an email saying, I got your note, thanks, I need time to think. Let me get back to you. So now you know, one, I received it. Two, you know you don't need an instant answer. And I know you might think on your end you do because you sent that text message, right? You send that text message. You ever had that moment where um, someone sends you a message and then 30 seconds later they follow it up with, what, are you mad? And you're like, no, I was in the bathroom. I didn't have my phone in my hands. It was 30 seconds, right? Give, claim time for yourself to think and give grace for the other person to think. That's going to be a huge, huge lifesaver. If you learn one thing, it's give the other person time to think. Give each other time to think. 
I try to be aware of that when I go in and I'm asking for a question. I'll say, hey, take your time and think about this. Or I don't need an answer on this for two weeks. Or I don't need an answer on this until three days or whatever it is. Give them time and claim your time yourself so you can help start be less overwhelmed by the email, by the text, by all that kind of stuff. Make sense? Do you love it? You learned something useful? All right, people. Well, I am out of time, so I am going to thank you tons for being here today. Thank you for uh, coming in, supporting Critical Issues Symposium. Again, round of applause to Erica and her team on the CIS for helping out and putting this thing together. Do you have any important announcements, Erica? Okay, so a little bit of a break. 325, we're going to be back in here for the panel. That would be your time to ask the panelists your questions and answers. So I hope you'll bring some. Thanks for coming, gang.